This feature, powered by AgVisor Pro, AgVisor Pro connects decision makers in agriculture to the advice, professionals, and services that they need to move forward with confidence. Hello, I'm Craig Lester, and this is the County Voice, a Rural Roots Canada production. Today, we have Elaine Fraze on the program. She's a certified farm transition coach, professional speaker, and author. She's known as Canada's Farm Whisperer. Welcome to the program, Elaine. Nice to be here, Craig. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, I am the mother to a successor, uh, married to Wes Fraze, and our company uh, that my son now runs is Boys Vane Select Seeds. So we run a certified seed business, wholesale retail, and a 5,000-acre certified seed farm on mile 16 north of the U.S. border in southern Manitoba, just 45 minutes straight south of Brandon. So how did you make the jump to this line of work? Uh, I've always been a farm kid, so I was born into the culture. I used to chase a lot of cows down the Trans-Canada Highway with my my dad's feedlot operation uh, when the cows got out. Um, but I became an extension home economist with Manitoba Agriculture way back in 1978, 43 years ago. And I married the local farmer, and I have been wired for communication, empathy, lifelong learning, positivity, and woo, which is winning others over. So in 2003, it became clear to me after doing a lot of per diem work for agriculture and taking my flip chart to family kitchen tables after an estate planning course that they ran, that it was time to really dwell and, and dig down into the emotional factors affecting planning and start helping families have courageous conversations. So I became a certified coach in 2003. I also started writing in Grain News 27 years ago in 1995. So farm audiences across Canada have heard me speak many times about clarity of expectations and certainty of agreements and a commitment to act. And I have a personal side to the story too, Craig, which is my mother died in the middle of her succession plan six weeks after we had our family meeting, which was quite traumatic and shocking to the family because she had an asthma attack and became comatose and died two weeks later. So, um, and that has had a long ripple effect with my own family tree and dynamic. And then I had a great textbook succession transition plan with my in-laws, Mar Abe and Margaret Fraze in 1992. Uh, sisters were given land, we bought the farm, sisters are happy, we all get together for Christmas. And then of course, now I'm in my third transition plan with our son Ian and his wife Kendra, my, my daughter-in-law who I love dearly and have a great relationship with and who is the daughter or the mother to three beautiful grandchildren who live next door. So it's a journey. So I just want your listeners to understand I am in the same journey that they are, but I want to give them practical, workable tools to get things done and, and to enjoy the journey. Well, that must be a very powerful tool for you to be able to give this relatable uh, information that say, hey, I'm in this exact same situation. How do you get this ball rolling so that they get onto this journey so that they have these courageous conversations? So the first thing I want your listeners to do is check their birth card. How old are you? If you're 40 listening to this, you're highly frustrated because dad and mom just are not letting go. They're likely 62, 64, 65. And they're not letting go because some parents, quite frankly, Craig, are embarrassed that they're not in the financial position that they hope they would be in by this time of their life. So from a, a coaching perspective, I'll just run through it real quick. In your 20s, you need to be independent. You need to get a trade. You need to go to college. You need to get skill sets beyond the farm. Then when you come back to farm in your mid-20s, hopefully you've learned how to do things from someone else besides your parents. In, as you age in place in the farm, whether you're in your 20s or 40s, doesn't matter. 30-year-olds are exhausted. My son has three kids. Sometimes he doesn't get good sleep. Um, you know, you're raising a family. You're building a business, building equity. But 40 is a very crucial age because when you're 40, you need to be in control of your own destiny. That's what the 40s are about. And a lot of 40-year-old young farmers, men and women, still do not have certainty around where their equity is gonna be growing, even if it has, been, has, has or not been growing even for the last five or 10 years. And then in your 50s, it's about quality of life and your 60s, I'm, in, I'm past 65 now, I just had a birthday last week. And for me, it's about starting over 
And for my husband, it is who's 65, it's stepping back because he sold one of the corporations to our son, the seed business, but he's stepping back without stepping away because he's out the door every morning at eight o'clock. He gets tired by eight o'clock at night, but he's very task oriented and he's not micromanaging his successor. He's mentoring him, right? And our son has not pushed us off the farm, which is a huge fear of the 60 year olds. And then in your 70s, who's my neighbor, he had to help have our help this year get his canola planted. And he came back and he was in tears, Craig, because he got 30 bushel an acre canola on a field that might have got zip because we planted it for him because he no longer has the energy to manage a whole whack load of cows, a hundred cows or whatever he has and nine quarters of land. And then we have our 80 year olds. And in Alberta, I have this special little piece of blog called strong warning for 80 year olds, because there are 80 year olds down the road from Rue in Rolling Hills that are hanging on for dear life because they're afraid of losing wealth and their money is their security. And they're tying up not only their 60 year old son, but their 25 year old granddaughter who wants to take over. And she can't even think about ownership if her dad and mom haven't even owned it yet. So do you see the domino effect here? That's huge. It's, it's funny how quickly that can pile up sort of thing if you're not paying attention and, and not really realize it at all, right? So. So, so you ask, what's the main thing? Pay attention to how old you are. And then the next thing is decide your approach. How are you going to get all generations to the table? And I mentioned grandpa because... I put this out on Twitter. I'm building an online course called, called the Family Harmony Nap, Map. And the first module is called Get to the Table. And one of my, one of my um, colleagues wrote me back. He said, Lane, don't forget. It can not only be two generations of, of buildup. It can be three, just like what we just mentioned. So how, what is your approach going to be, Craig, to get everyone to the table? And I say, who's going to be the driver of that process? And quite often... It's the youngest generation. As you mentioned, there has to be an eye in this to get them to the table. So they, but what role do you play in, in helping facilitate that? So mostly what I do is I pr provide a safe and respectful place for conversations to happen. But we now, I now have a coaching team because I have a succession plan for my coaching business. So I have eight coaches who work with me. And they do a lot of the pre-work. So the pre-work is getting everybody prepped, getting generation, grandpa's generation, the founders, the, the parents, and then and the successors and the non-farm heirs, getting everybody prepped by having private confidential coaching conversations so that you could all come to the table with an idea of what you want. But we also uncover a lot of assumptions along the way because I will hear what grandpa wants. I will hear what mom and dad wants. I will hear what successors want. And I'm going, wow, they really don't know how disconnected they are. But I do because I've, I'm holding or the coach is holding all this amazing information. And it's not our job to relay messages between the generation. That's the work that happens at a facilitated family meeting. You mentioned assumptions there. What other common mistakes do you see, uh, see made? Huge one is procrastination. We'll get it after harvest. We'll get it done after harvest, Craig. Nope, we'll get it done after freeze up. Nope, we'll get it done after Christmas. Nope, we'll get it after mom and dad are back from Arizona. No, nope, we'll get it done after Easter. No, nope, we'll get it done after planting. No, nope, we'll get it done after fungiciding. No, nope, we'll get it done after haying. No, nope, we'll get it done after harvest. Do you see what I just did? I just went through an entire farm year. And I didn't mention calving. <laughs> right? Yeah, and next thing you know, that's two farm years or three farm years because it's the exact same thing year after year, right? Right. And so I I say the two biggest things killing agriculture right now in terms of succession transition planning are procrastination, putting it off because of this innate fear that if we do start talking about it, we're going to have this huge family blow up. But conflict is not bad. That's the other thing, Craig is that conflict that's resolved is a beautiful thing because then you get clarity. The second, the second thing is that avoidance of conflict. And we know what the price of land is doing in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba and BC and everywhere, right? And Southern Ontario, whoever's listening to this. And there's been a lot of 
um, we were just quoted Kent Goulash, who's one of my coaches from Saskatoon. He and I were interviewed by Andrew Lovell with Country Guide in September, and it was called a new path. And the new path is the land is is of high value, and that value gets talked about really early. And expectations for the containment and keeping that land intact gets talked about really early, so that people don't have these wacko assumptions that. Just because I'm the fourth child in this farm, I get a quarter of the land. Where was that written? Right? So we have really big pressure. And have you bought a combine lately? We did. They're expensive, yeah. right? Keeping your equipment upgraded. And then the risk that the farming child takes. But then there's the flip side. I was talking to another accountant friend of mine. And he said, Elaine, don't forget about the sense of entitlement of the farming kid or the farming successor. And I don't find that very often, Craig. I, I find entitlement of people who have unreasonable expectations on the pressure of their parents' estate. And the other thing that, that people who follow moral good will understand is everyone listening to this right now, if you would just take a piece of paper, put a line down the middle, put farm assets and farm wealth on the left hand side put personal assets and a personal wealth bubble on the right hand side the problem in agriculture is many farmers have not used financial planning to their advantage and so they don't have tfsas they don't have built up rrsps they don't have non-farm property they have put very little on the personal side and they say well when i get to retirement age or whatever i'll just sell stuff okay do you want to sell your land? Not really. Can your son or daughter who's succeeding you afford the land? Well, our son can't. He can't. He he could afford buying the seed business, and he's paying us a nice uh, yearly uh, payment amortized over twenty years that the business can self generate. So he doesn't come up with cash out of his pocket. There's another problem. Do you even know what it costs you to live? Because young farmers in low, you know, Brooks, Alberta or wherever, it's 74 to 84 K a year to raise a family. And, and so where's the disposable income for debt? Am I depressing you right now? <laughs> a little bit. And it's funny that you bring this up sort of thing. And that was one of my questions I was going to get to. So I'm going to jump to there right now sort of thing. How does, inflation rates and it, the increasing interest rates that we're seeing right now affect this conversation and i guess what should people be paying attention to it they should pay attention to their money scripts craig so my first question to them is what do you need for basic family living for your family living line and wes and i have kept track for years and years on quickbooks i don't do the inputting never have but i know that i spend seventy five thousand dollars a year on living and that's not counting my uh, investments and my charitable donations. That's an over and above that, okay? The next thing they need to learn is what is the farm paying for? So what are the farm perks that are part of your family living? Because for some families, that's fourteen dollars to $20,000 a year of boost. And I have a sheet from Dick Whitman called the compensation worksheet that listeners are happy to just go to farmfamilycoach.com and ask me, um, for that, I'd be happy to send it to them. So, you know, the inflation thing is knowing your numbers and knowing your data. Then the next question is, what's mom and dad's number? Because Wes's number for living in retirement or in a different, and he's never going to retire. So that's another whole conversation. But for as he ages on the farm, it's a, he said 120,000, which is fair. And so, but when I ask couples, when I ask founders, Craig, what do you want to live in? Their first out of their mouth word is, well, I don't know. It's because they've never kept track. They've just mushed everything together. And so FCC does have a family living expense sheet that you can get off their website. I just say, go to your bank statements for the last couple of years and see what you've spent on personal living so that you know what you, and then, so if the number is $80,000 a year, like it would take care of me versus $250,000, which some of my clients ask for, that's a big gap. That's a lot of cash flow, right? And I think back in the farm management days, maybe 10 years ago, they said for every new person you bring back to the farm, you have to have $500,000 more gross income. 
So there's the viability question around the numbers and inflation. How many families can actually be supported by this farm business? And just because you have three sons or three daughters, where is it written that there is room or viability for all three of those kids to come back? Because quite often I have to help navigate the hard conversation and say, I know you'd love to come back, but sorry, it's not workable unless you bring an extra $500,000 income with you with your diverse operation that you want to create here, right? And that's a really good thing because that sometimes that's assumed that, oh, I'll just cut, you'll go and do my thing for a while. It'll and be your fallback position. What happened when the oil patch shrank, Craig? What happened? Probably a people, lot of people went back People home. start, what do you mean you're back here? You said you'd never come back here. You said you hated this place. What are you doing here, right? And 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 that causes that inability to have tough conversations is what's keeping agriculture stuck. So I have a tool called the conflict dynamic profile that you can do online. You can buy it on my website, but it, it helps us understand our positive conflict behavior. And I think we should just land there just for a second. Can you express your emotions? I am deeply sorry that you expect to have a quarter of our land, but that's an unreasonable expectation. That won't be happening. But I'd like to create other solutions to be fair to you as an heir of, of my family. But the farm is going to be kept intact as a business. And you may think that your brother and sister has all this unfair advantage, but I would like you to reach out to them and say, in, in terms of how I look at fairness, it's Fairness is helping everyone in the family be successful. And I'll use my own family as I always do in my, in my speeches. My brother closest to me and myself have always been wealthier than my parents. So when we had that estate planning meeting in 1998 at the office in Winnipeg with my parents, I was very clear about my expectations. I had none, Craig. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem is parents aren't talking to their kids adult children about their expectations in terms of the estate. And here's the other thing. Transition is for the transfer of labor, management and ownership of the farm. An estate is for when you die and that's around your assets, right? Those are two separate kinds of plans. They're interwoven of course, but they're different kinds of discussions. And how often you talked about people mushing everything together. And I know we weren't necessarily referring just to this, but it also applies here. How often do you come in and people kind of have put these things and put them as one? Well, how many farmers, and I'll ask you a question back. Sorry. Awesome. How many farmers have said, Craig, I have my succession plan done, Craig. It's all in my will. No, that's not a succession plan. That's an estate plan for when you're dead. And what I, I, I prefer, I have a huge bias towards gifts and transfers with a warm hand, not a cold one. And we had a CAFA tax update just recently, and it kind of hit me in the face that Manitoba has probably some of the most workable land transfer tax things in the whole country, because in, in Ontario, it doesn't work the same way. And so there's this huge backlog of property tax and all kinds of tax issues of people trying to transfer farm assets that's really keeping farmers in Ontario up at night. So again, it behooves all of us to have really good accountants, really good financial planners, really good coaches, and really good lawyers, like to build a team of advisors that's going to help you keep unfolding the path because you make decisions for tax. It's a very tactical thing that I think is at the bottom of the process. What's at the top of the process is people's emotions, how they want to create solutions, how they want to adapt, how they want to reach out, and how they want to put themselves in the other person's shoes. Do you know what it feels like to be 65 and think that you don't have enough for yourself and how are you going to break the news to your kids? That would so be a very hard one. Well, and, and I, someone used the term humiliation. And I'd never thought of that before, Craig, but the fear of loss of wealth is real. And a lot of those 80 year old grandpas in Alberta are hanging on really tight because they've known scarcity. They've, they've seen lack. They remember 1981 and 19% interest rates. They, they can feel it in their bones. And so for them to let go 
they need to have some kind of better security to move towards or life estates or really well-written agreements that says, dad, you're golden. We're going to take care of you. We're going to trickle this out to you over time. We've met with a financial planner. It's all um, agreed upon. We've checked out the assisted living homes. They're $4,000 a month. There's money set aside for that. You are covered. But you see, they're just not even having those conversations. So I guess yeah. what we'll start, I, I guess the next thing I was going to ask you about was just uh, in regards to, we've been talking about the people in the 70s and 80s, they're still holding on to land sort of thing, and we're getting late there. Maybe someone gets sick. What do you recommend in that case if they haven't done that? As you, you've mentioned, a lot of people are in this boat. What happens if they, they're up against the clock? And where do you think? Uh, and, and, again, and again, I lost a sister to a drunk driver at age 23. I lost my father-in-law to brain shrinking disease, which is why my phrase family succession plan only took six months. It was a race against time. My mother there died of an asthma attack at age 65 after her succession plan. Her new will was not yet signed. So I, I've lived this, Craig, this urgency thing. And I don't want people to make decisions out of a sense of urgency. I want people to make decisions that are well thought out, well communicated and well facilitated by a really good team of advisors. And in order to do that, somebody in your family has to be the driver. And it's typically the women because they're tired of the conflict. And the women, quite frankly, my age are tired of farming. And then we haven't even talked about divorce. And we haven't talked about, you know, having pre-marriage agreements or, or marriage contracts to protect the assets of the farm, which have lots more zeros around them on the balance sheet. So people say, whoa, whoa, Elaine, where do we start? You start by talking and you come from curiosity, not judgment. And you start asking, what is it you truly want? How much is enough? How do you see your life unfolding as you age in place on this farm? And everybody in that farm team, including the in-laws, needs a voice at that table. And so I just, you know, people say, well, Elaine, it's very complex. I always say, you're making it harder than it needs to be. And yes, the complex things you, you can turn over to the professionals who can help you be tax efficient and can sign, you know, Mona Brown was on the that tax update too, and she was talking about the infeasibility of, of land transfers. And oh my goodness, and you just asked me about what do we do about the land? Well, I like the transfer of land to be done while people are alive because I've seen wills changed and I, I don't like that. And I like to see names on titles like, for the people who are gonna be farming it. But if you put a name on a title, you better be sure that's the name you want because once you put it on, it's really, really hard to remove, right? And then there's the divorce field. Well, we'll put his name on it, but we certainly won't put her name on it. Well, that's how you protect with marriage contracts. So there's lots of ways, Craig, but it's the spirit of how things are done. And I call that the culture of your farm. What do you believe to be true? In our family, we have, we have zero, zero tolerance for dishonesty. And we integrity is one of our highest values. We're seed growers, for Pete's sake. We have to be. And then high value for teamwork. I have a high value for independence. So I've always had off farm income that contributes to the cash flow of family living, right? So are you honoring the values represented in your farm? And the second thing is, how are you treating each other? Because for the young farmers listening to this that are feeling trapped, I just want them to know there's other people down the road that you could be in a joint venture with and not working with family who are not nice people. And then the third thing is, how are you making decisions? And our kids have heard us talk about all kinds of farming decisions ever since they were five years old at the kitchen table. So who, who is the ultimate decision maker on your farm? Is it still the 75 year old? Or is the 40 year old getting mentorship and decision making opportunity to be able to be a good manager? You've mentioned uh, spouses, particularly in divorce situations there. I want to back up a little bit on that one. And you've talked about culture, the family, when the family dynamic changes and someone is welcomed into the family, what are some of the smaller things that can help ease that, that transition? Well, one of them is um, to 
seriously, and I, I this is going to sound like a sales pitch, but I have a book called Farming's In-Law Factor. It's right here. I'm, I still have a thousand copies left, but it was printed in 2014. And it's a brown egg. One of these eggs is not like the other, right? So the person coming into the family dynamic is going to do communication differently, is going to do conflict differently. So the first thing is to get really clear about what's expected of them. I'm coaching a family right now that just had a marriage last year. The daughter-in-law is oblivious to the expectation that she should be bringing meals to the field, that she should be driving the grain cart, that she should be working as hard as her husband's siblings who also come to help out with the farm. And that is because they've never sat down and talked about, Craig, role expectations right? We also have something now happening in agriculture that I've not seen before, where you have spouses who want absolutely nothing to do with the farm. And was that agreed to before the marriage or the cohabitation? I don't know. So it's these unwritten rules and assumptions and unspoken roles, expectations, you need to sit down and say, you know what, I'm just curious, why are you going to do something else that I see on Facebook when you, when we're in the middle of a you know multi-thousand acre harvest and you're nowhere to be found? And you're like, what what what's what's this about? Well, nobody told me I was supposed to be here, right? Mm -hmm. So th there's there's all these unwritten rules and expectations. And silence is a form of abuse, actually, when you don't explain to people you know, where your discontent is. So coming into a new dynamic. And the other thing I, as a, a new person, new spouse coming in, I'd watch very clearly, very carefully about the culture of the family. How do they, how do they deal with conflict and how do they celebrate things? Dr. Nikki Gerard, who was a psychologist in Saskatoon, did a, a study way back in the day, 1997, I think, called What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger. And she studied farm families, Craig, for 12 years. And she distilled it to three things, the ability to communicate, the ability to celebrate, i.e. Christmas, Thanksgiving, the end of harvest, good things, to, to be grateful and, re and rejoice and be thankful for the good things. And the, uh, the third piece was connection, connection to the community, which means that you aren't operating in isolation, that you're reaching out, helping the neighbors, the neighbors help you. And I remember being in Kananaskis at a, an egg excellence meeting, I think, with my husband. And we were describing how we buy equipment with other farmers. Like we have a scraper that was shared. We used to have a pea roller that was shared. And we were talking about all this cooperative decision making with our neighbors. And this one woman said, that would never happen in Alberta. <laughs> and I'm just going, well, you know, it's how you decide to show up and the choices that you want to make on how you want to live. And for in-laws, it's brutal when they feel like the women have to be kept out of everything. And we still have patriarchal thinking in agriculture where the men as corporate partners say, let's keep this simple. Let's just keep the women out of it. And when I hear that, Craig, in 2022, I shiver. I just don't like that. Because in my world, you're cutting off your right arm. Yeah. I see a married I see a married couple as a dynamic unstoppable unit. And I have seen 15 seriously 15 million dollar farms go down the drain to lot less because of one spouse refusing to be even signing agreements. Right? Yeah. But we all know if you're unequally yoked, it's not going to be, you just have this picture. I have this picture of these two beautiful Belgian horses going over the hills in your backyard. If they're in this yoke and they're pulling together in the same direction with equal strength, they're unstoppable. Absolutely. And that's my hope for agriculture. Guys, why are you not, you know, guys will spend thousands on fertilizer and thousands on their new X9 combines and da, 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 da. They're not paying attention to their own personal development, Craig, in, able, in, in how they communicate or how they do conflict. If they ignore their marriage, it's to their peril. And I, I just found a great counseling site that people can do on Zoom. And it's called um, onlyoneforever.com. And it's clinical psychologists who do counseling for marriage and Zoom all across Canada. And I'm just telling you, we are I, we will be having a, 
an article come out soon in December on divorce on the farm. Because in my practice, I now have women who are divorcing calling me and saying, Elaine, what's my next step here? And we have divorce financial planners now. We have divorce coaches. I don't do that kind of work, but I have to know where the resources are. But it's a reality of people not working out expectations. And that's and that's incredible. I'm sure there's a lot of people, listeners or viewers and listeners who are going to be relating to these exact situations and they're and they're dealing with that. Was there anything uh, that you wanted to add, Elaine, that I have asked you? Well, I guess the thing that we talked about earlier, Craig, is why. Why are you not doing this work? And the reason you're not doing this work of getting people together to talk is because you're afraid. So I really would like everybody to do some self-reflection on what are you afraid of? Why are you not coming to the table? And do you need insight? Do you need to know how to communicate more clearly? We'll give you language. We'll give you phrases like, where is that written? Or that was then and this is now. Um, I call them my phrase that pays. It's a, it's a playoff on my, world, my, my last name. I believe that every family can have harmony as they go through this, but they need to do the work. And first place is, how old are you? What do you want? How much do you need to live? So the three key questions to wrap up, Craig, are what are your income streams? All generations. Where is that income coming from? Number two is where are you going to live? Because I live in this beautiful house that was built in 1960. My, my husband was in grade four when he moved into this house. I'm standing in my father-in-law's minister's office because beside being a, a farmer, he was also a preacher. All right. So I've always had this beautiful office. But the third thing that's really keeping family stuck is fairness. How can you help everyone in your family be successful? And where is it written that parents are responsible for making all of their children economically equal? Because in certain cultural families, which I shall not name, but they are from Europe, there's this thing, if I have four children, Boom, da boom, da boom. They all get exactly the same. That's no longer workable and that's an unrealistic expectation. And what if your son or daughter are a dentist in Calgary and have more money than you do? Just saying. That's a really good point. Elaine, thank you uh, so much for taking time to talk with us this afternoon. I know I have a lot of relatable situations I was hearing as you were speaking there. And I'm sure a lot of other people do as well. Right. And I just more than happy to help people take the next step so craig need to go to farmfamilycoach.com and they can reach out to me on my contact page we offer free discovery calls of 15 20 minutes to help people know how to take the next step and what i'd really like people to do is go to my blog tab to insights and sign up because every two weeks we come out with articles and videos to keep the message going just to keep people encouraged to take the next step because i truly want everyone to find harmony in their families to be rich in a relationship. That's my whole reason for being. That would be an incredibly valuable resource for every family to have it uh, in their lives. So thank you very much for providing that. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Pleasure to be here. If you like this feature, be sure to check us out on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook, and to check out the Podcast Farm, one of the largest podcast collection of ag-based podcasts uh, in the country at ruralrootscanada.com. Thanks for joining us on The County Voice, a Rural Roots Canada production. I'm Craig Lester. This feature powered by AgVisor Pro. AgVisor Pro connects decision makers in agriculture to the advice, professionals, and services that they need to move forward with confidence. 